behind the bar. My life is more than money and jewelry. My story's so crazy, dog. I said make a movie behind the bar. I went from playing sports to exotic whips. Ain't gotta tell me, dog. I know I'm the shit behind the bar. My life is more than money and jewelry. My story's so crazy, dog. I said make a movie behind the bar. I went from music exec to this podcast. Now I finally feel at home and laugh behind the bar. Yo, what's good? You listen to a brand new episode of Behind the Baller podcast. I am your host, Ben Baller, aka the Korean John Cusack. Definitely not the Korean John Choir, though. <laughs> Yo, this is episode 79, bitch. I hope everyone is doing well out there. Or at least I hope they're doing the best that they can be at this point, right? I know we're opening up in a lot of areas we're going into phase two and all this other bullshit i don't know what the fuck the terminology exactly means but i know that we are starting to open up and i know that there's going to be a lot more cases and the next few weeks are going to be interesting i am going to be staying home right i mean i go out to get food i go out to get groceries and things and uh we'll get into more more about that in a little bit but um i know a lot of people right now are truly feeling it And um, I said this months ago. And the thing that to, you know, I'm going to be the the glass half full and glass half empty. Right now, I'm going to be that dude who's who's, uh, looking at it half full because I got to tell people. We're not anywhere near. Like, I don't even think, honestly, to tell you the truth, I think we're still in the beginning stages of everyone feeling this economic shit where people are like, yo, I got to work. I'm sorry. People are getting arrested getting cited and shit and uh, judges are giving fucking sentences out for opening their businesses and everything. And people are like, yo, um, is it wrong to feed our kids? Is it, is it wrong to be, you know, I'm not being selfish, you know, I'm starving and and boom. And and it's deeper than that. It's getting people sick and fucking up the health system. Right. And, you know, I just noticed I, I get sidetracked so fucking much. Right. But look, the economy isn't going to get better for a little bit. All right. Us shutting this shit down for a minute fucked a lot of things up. And you just have to, as fucked up as it sounds, you got to suck it up. You know, there's nobody you could blame. Right. Trump wants to blame China and everything else. And I want to blame motherfucking Trump. And speaking of Trump, you know, I find out that people that I follow, I'm I'm, more than an an acquaintance with, you know, people that I know. And um, the way the internet is, it's not really that awkward to meet somebody on the internet, right? I met my wife on Facebook, right? And we had met before, she said, I don't remember, but going, what I'm getting at is I see people who defend Trump. And look, at the end of the day, whether you see it one way or the other, there's science and there's math, right? And I say this all the time. There's no way three plus three will not equal six. It has to, because that's what math is, right? So again, when Donald Trump and this is a metaphor when he says three plus three equals, you know, eight. And people defend him and say, well, actually it does. You know, if you do this in Roman times and blah, blah, whatever. And, you know, in the fucking, you know, the, the Verizon 5G, blah, blah, whatever. It's like, no, motherfucker, no. And so with the coherent mind, a clear mind and head, how do you still back this dude? Why? And I have no, you know, I've said this, I think I have. I have no loyalty towards Democrats or Republicans or independents or whatever the fuck it is. It's like, who's best for this? I'm not jumping on, right? Because because I'm conservative and I'm also, well, I'm not really conservative, but at the same time, like, I'm just so many different things. You, you, you can't, I can't pick one, right? I fuck with Obama heavy. Anyways, this shit is just going to be crazy. There's nobody you can blame. There's nothing you can do about it. So I just look, man, I'm, I don't want to get into the whole COVID talk, right? It is what it is. My factory has just opened up, and um, I do have things to get get popping down there, and I haven't figured out what I'm going to do. But I'm not in an immediate rush. I know that Jay Balvin right now is going to start, if someone tells him that my factory is open, he's going to start blowing my phone up and asking what the fuck's going on on the whole other spectrum. I got someone like Afrojack who's dropped a bag and he has no idea when he's going to get his chance. And I don't think he's even bothered. He hasn't even fucking texted me in months, which is like fucking best clients in the world. Going on, um, look, we have become super reliant on Wi-Fi, all right? We're in a really, really just unique time in life. Obviously, I can't express enough 
how much we've never seen this shit happen before, right? The world shut down, whatever, and the whole you know thing with the virus. And it's crazy. And again, I can't explain to you how different it is. And literally dealing with kid gloves, right? Dealing with the virus with kid gloves because my son London has the situation he has. With that said, um, not just me, not just you, everyone, right? Everyone listening, how you listen to this podcast, okay? You are reliant to streaming data, you know, Wi-Fi. And it's so crazy that you could call it a drug because if you don't have Wi-Fi and you're somewhere you don't really have like cellular service, imagine how fucked up you're going to feel, right? Some people be like, oh, fuck, I'll read a book and everything else. Look, man, when you got kids, you have a business that's reliant on Wi-Fi and everything else, this shit could hold you hostage. Do you know, this is a really fucking crazy thing. In a certain way, with what I do in my life, if they were to raise, raise the prices on Wi-Fi, I wouldn't say shit as long as it was much more reliable. And with that said, um, I've had a fucking terrible week. And the reason why my week has been so shitty has been because my Wi-Fi started tripping about a week ago. And I could not fucking figure it out for the life of me, all right? Um, I don't know if you guys know this, but I'm running a, a mesh Wi-Fi system in my house, right, with Google Wi-Fi. And it's been the best thing I've ever used in my entire life. I've had Wi-Fi since the beginning of fucking time, since it started. And um, when I first heard of mesh Wi-Fi, I was like, I don't know, you know. But think about it. You know, you have extenders, you have routers, you have things like that. Those things work. They're okay. But when you're talking about you want to have, like, you want to stream over 250 MBP, over 100 MBPS, all over the house, no matter where the fuck you are, by the pool, in the fucking basement, in the roof, wherever the fuck you are, you want to have consistency. And with mesh Wi-Fi, that's what it allows you to do. These primary points, these Wi-Fi points, they speak to each other via like a cloud and it's just fucking 10 times more convenient. It's amazing. And for some reason, the shit start tripping. So I have sit today, since the last podcast, in fact, even like right after um, episode 77, I have spent just over nine hours talking to Google Text. And maybe about three hours talking to Spectrum, trying to figure this shit out, right? I'm thinking to put a 5G tower up in this bitch. Finally, right, after all this shit, this dude whose name is AJ works for Spectrum, works tech support. He did some investigating and he found out the real issue, okay? And I can't even explain to you how many fucking calls I've had that when I talked to this guy finally... I had like a 10 minute fucking intro to my conversation and let them know how serious this shit is because every day it's something and no one can figure it out. Google thought it was one thing. They thought it was a firewall blocking the modem so they couldn't speak to the cloud and all this other shit and it was driving me crazy. Why was it driving me crazy? Because my son's healthcare is connected to Wi-Fi. His primary, everything you could think of, okay? My kids' Zoom classes are connected to Wi-Fi. They went off Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. They dropped, I can't even fucking tell you how embarrassing that is because they have classes at different times. So, you know, it's a fucked up situation. And obviously me doing, I, I went on uh, Daniel Arsham's uh, Instagram Live and I did a show and I had to find a place in the house because I don't have great Wi-Fi, uh, cellular service, you know, where I'm at in my neighborhood. And, um, you know, I got like two bars. So I'm streaming from my fucking cell and it's just like, dude, this is fucking, I was so angry. Monday and Tuesday were probably my worst days. I was ready to fucking, I was at my wits end. I was going to kill somebody. When we dropped the app, I was already ready to fucking kill everyone. Tuesday, same thing. Now, I thought I'd fixed the problem. I had like changed the DNS service, all this other shit, blah, 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 whatever. And I thought I'd fix that Tuesday night and then to come find out Wednesday night, I didn't, which was last night. So anyways, AJ from New York at Spectrum, thank you very much. Um, uh, you are the fucking man. And uh, going on, everything is connected to Wi-Fi. I have 45 devices in my home connected to the Wi-Fi, right? I have a, a shared Wi-Fi, you know, and then and then I have, you know, the guest Wi-Fi. And I connect my kids' phones to a family setup to where on Google, you can kind of like, you know, shut their internet off and you could also prevent them from looking at certain things. You could allow, you know, certain, certain streaming. And, you know, both my kids, they stream games and they play Minecraft, they play Roblox and all that shit. But, it got me thinking about school and it was crazy because I was taking a nap yesterday 
and I'm just being transparent. This is my life. You know, this is real. I was, I was asleep and Kid Cudi calls me out of nowhere. And uh, Cudi will just do that. Just random as fuck. And I was dead asleep. I had my alarm clock on and I woke up to a call from him. And I was like, yo, what's good? He's like, yo, man, you asleep? And I'm like, nah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I was just, I just woke up. And he's like, you, did I wake you up? I'm like, yeah, you actually did. And he's like, are you mad about it? And I'm like, no, nah, I'm not mad. I'm like, I'm never mad when Scott calls, right? Like, and um, I told him what was going on. He's like, yo, everything cool with you? He's just always checking on my mental health and everything and making sure I'm all right. And I, I had a rough week last week. And he's like, yo, you good? And what's up? And I told him what was going on. And it got to thinking, because he has a kid too, right? You know, I don't know if you know Kid Cudi has a kid. And so, um, that sounded crazy, right? Um, kid Cudi has a kid. So he's thinking about, you know, the inner city parts of, of Cleveland and even schools he went to. And he's like, wait a second, how the fuck does this public school system work? Because your kids are in private, right? I'm like, yeah, my kids are in private, you know, and we pay in bandos, you know, it's, it's, it's expensive. And um, he's saying, all right, so what about the public school system? And I'm like, bro, you, you got to ask somebody else. I don't know how that works. And he's like, there's no way everyone has computers, and I'm like, fuck having computers. You need to have a camera because it's Zoom classes. You need to have a camera on your computer or an iPad, which I don't know if iPads could, they, they do, but not most kids have the iPad or the tablets that type fast enough, right, to have the Zoom to type. Or I don't know what, what the fuck it is, but you'd have to have something sophisticated like that. And where the issue came in to stream, you'd have to have a certain uh, amount of Wi-Fi, right? And I got into this discussion with Cuddy and Cuddy's like, yo, man, I don't think every kid got Wi-Fi. And I'm like, I don't think so either. That's definitely, you know, definitely not something I think that is just, you know, out there like that. But anyways, fucked up situation. I was kind of bummed out about it. And then I was like, damn, you know, um, look, I said this in, in an interview recently. And, um, you know, people have expectations, right? And I read this book. Um, I read a part of it, Phil Jackson's book. And uh, this is after he won all the fucking championships. And he put this quote was, don't have any expectations, you know, be disappointed. Now, look, I don't care if people are doing less, you know, not doing as well as me. They have less than me. If people aren't doing good in life or whatever it may be, look, that's them. I have certain expectations for me. I want better in life overall. There's a certain level of life I like to live. And if I'm not living that, then I need to go and do whatever the fuck I have to do to get to that point in life. And that's just where I am every day, whether it be, 2010, 2008, 2000, 1996, you know, 2020. And with that said, you know, uh, it sucks. I would love to help other people. I can't help out everybody, but I will help people out. I always have been a, a helper. And, um, you know, it, it's, we got to figure something out with that shit. And I don't know what the fuck 5G is going to do. If 5G is supposed to be better than, I can't imagine 5G being faster than a gigabyte, right? One up, one down, 1000 Mbps. But anyways, we're opening up. There's a big five that I know that I used to go to and they're opening up and they said something, I, I'm confused. It says curbside service. So what I'm asking is I'm confused. Like, all right, so I need some swim goggles. I actually need, there's like 15 different kinds because I buy my kids goggles, you know, here and there, they lose them, they crack them. And it's like, all right. And then, um, yeah, um, I need those uh, those New Balance 570s in the gray color. And, it, and it's like, I couldn't fucking imagine this big five has a million SKUs in there, right? But they're opening up. And I don't know when IF and Co opens up. I think by the end of the month we might be. And I don't know how that's going to work, right, with the distancing and all this shit. And uh, that's about as much as I'm going to talk about all that shit, right? This is just a fucked up situation, and uh, I don't, I don't really know. But I did do Daniel Arsham's show, like I mentioned, and he asked me some really good questions. I don't know if it's going to be streamed somewhere else. The stream must be really poor on my side because of how fucked up it was, but. He asked me some dope questions about, you know, art and things like that. And he respects me. And the thing about Daniel is that he has a very niche art, right? And it's beyond abstract. He's a fucking, I don't know what's going on. But I think if we opened up Daniel's head, we'd find an Apple IIe in there somewhere. But the processor in there would be the current processor that you'd find in the best MacBook 16-inch, right? But yeah, no, Daniel's a fucking dope dude. And thank you again, Daniel, for saving my life save my family's life from getting the coronavirus, which if you guys don't know the story, then fuck you. But um, I want to mention that I am doing David Meltzer's show. David Meltzer is a, or Mel Meltzer, yeah, David Meltzer, M-E-L-Z-T-E-R. Uh, this guy is an entrepreneur. He's an exports agent. He has a podcast. 
He crushes it. This dude is the fucking man. And uh, if you guys know who Lee Steinberg is, then you know that this guy is one of the most brilliant, amazing sport agents in the history of sports agents. And um, if you watch the movie Jerry Maguire, that movie was based upon Lee Steinberg's, you know, life. And uh, David Meltzer was the CEO of his company. So anyways, David asked me some really good questions on his show. He is really good about not getting people on there too long because, fuck, I could talk for hours and hours, right? But I was on there for maybe 30 minutes or so, but it was a good show. He had me on a live and I said some great things. He said some amazing things to me too um, as far as what he thought. But yeah, man, um, definitely check that out. And I'll definitely be pushing it as it is uh, going on. Baseball cards are going fucking crazy right now. Period. Point blank. All right. Everyone in the hobby right now, and if you don't know, the hobby is the baseball card collecting community. Okay. Baseball cards are going fucking crazy. Just so you know, ever since I sold that crazy ass number, 35,000 fucking Mike Trout cards, shit has been going crazy with this Tops 2020 project. I got something else I'm cooking up with Tops, and I've been looking at cards. And my Ichiro sold 1,324 cards, right? I totally forgot that it was the first card of the entire series. When this is all said and done, there'll be 400 cards total in the series. 20 players, 20 artists, right? My Ichiro was number one. So not only was it number one, it was like the second or third lowest selling because it was the first one. No one knew what to fucking expect, right? So the card was 1995, okay? If you bought a 10-pack, they give you a discount. It's like $12, $13, whatever. If you buy 10, they encourage you to buy more, whatever it is. I don't know. I don't really know how the hobby how it works, but I'm just starting to understand it a lot better now. And, you know, if you bought it at 20, whatever it may be, I didn't follow the Ichiro too long. Thank you to one of my followers who's actually in Seattle, Washington. I did buy my Ichiro Artist Proof from him. And uh, he sold to me for a really good price. And I, I thank you for it because you are fucking a G for that. But the crazy thing is the artist proofs were going for $99 on the first couple sets, right? Now the artist proofs are going for $199. There's only 20. And my complaint was there should be 100 because that 20 is just ridiculous. The bots get them and they just sell so fucking fast. It's fucked up. So with that said, I just checked the Ichiro yesterday. And my Ichiro, my regular motherfucking Ichiro card hit 400 fucking dollars. And now some of these cards are going for 250, 300, 400 bucks. And I'm like, yo, this shit hit 20 times its value. And I told people it will go up. Frank Thomas, two, three days ago, was going for 30 bucks all day long, which is, you know, just getting started. Now the card is going for 75 and it's going to keep going up. My trout is, you know, people are like, oh, it's fucked up, whatever. I trust me, I promise you. Just because it was a super iconic card, no matter how high the print run was, it's going to go up. So with all that said, you know, I got some major shit going on in the hobby. It's getting exciting. This Topps 2020 project, people are glowing up. Man, my boy Blake just sold fucking, I think, four or 5,000 Ricky Henderson cards. And my next card is Ricky Henderson. So, you know, I had to go to the town. I had to hit up my boy, Mr. Fab. I had to have a conversation with Too Short just to make sure I represent Oakland correctly. You know what I'm saying? And uh, speaking of Oakland, by the way, my Ricky Henderson card drops next week. Speaking of Oakland, um, I just watched this Netflix movie called All Day and a Night. And uh, oh, fuck, I forgot the fucking dude's name, man. But he was in Moonlight and then... Uh, he played the kid, like the little knucklehead in Equalizer Part 2. And this dude is a really, really bright, you know, rising star. And this movie, All Day and the Night, is like, you know, it's like a 2020 Menace to Society, kind of. But it's based in the town, based in Oakland, in current time. And Jeffrey Wright, who you already know, is one of my favorite actors of all time, right? Jeffrey Wright plays this dude's dad. And it's just based in Oakland, you know, you know, dad's a fucking base head and, and the son's in trouble, you know, dealing drugs, hustling and running around the town, sideshows and shit and everything. And it's just crazy. And it's, it's real and it's super violent and it's really like powerful. And, and, and it was a good fucking movie. So that's one movie that I definitely suggest you guys watching. But uh, back to baseball real quick. 
my man Jock Peterson, he blessed me with a sick ass Dodger Blue custom players Rawlings glove. So I just want to give a shout out to my boy uh, Jock Peterson. He is the man. And uh, look, man, check this out. Since we're on the sports topic right now, I got big baby Glenn Davis on the show today. And, uh, you know, some of you who don't know, if you if you don't know who Big Baby is, and it's really not, like, you have to be fucking a 16-year-old right now listening to this. If you're 21, there's no reason for you not to know who the fuck Big Baby is, especially if you if you watch sports and, you know, look at sports and everything. Dude won a chip and everything else. He had some issues. He had some struggles. And that's a real shit. It's a, I feel for dude. You know, everyone in the NBA, you got to be fucking, just to keep and stay on a team, it's fucking insane. Because each year, think about it. There's all these players coming out of high school, going to college. Then you got all the baddest motherfuckers in college, right? Then they're all going, they get drafted in the NBA. After the first round, even in the second round of the NBA, it's like, none of these guys really stick around, right? And then those guys, are they here in two or three years? Most likely not. And you know, they're out trying to play in the G League, you know, and fucking play overseas, whatever. And uh, Big Baby won a championship. You know, he won a chip. And, he, you know, he went around and he had a little bit of a unfortunate situation, uh, combined with maybe slightly a little bit of hating and politics and things like that. But anyways, we got big baby Glenn on the show. And uh, actually, we get into some shit today. Um, I'm going to warn you guys. I'm going to be honest with you guys. It starts off a little slow. And, and uh, I, I, you know, it's a strange time right now. But uh, fuck this. Miles, you know what to do. Hit me with that lakey lake. And when you hear that lakey lake, you already know what's going down. We're about to get into an interview with Big Baby. Let's motherfucking go. Yo, yo, you are tuned in to Behind the Baller. We have another special guest, former NBA star and world champion, played with the Celtics, the Magic, the Clippers, also won a chip in the big three with power. Let's get into it. Glenn, Big Baby Davis, what's good, bro? What's the deal, baby? What's the deal? Man. Ain't nothing, man. Just chilling, bro. Trying to survive in the corona, man. (laughs) <laughs> Where are you at right now, currently? Uh, right now, I'm located in Las Vegas. Oh, you in Vegas right now? Oh, yeah, well, yeah, I saw the, the 702 number. Um, man, let's get right into it, bro. What was it like growing up in Baton Rouge, you know, Louisiana? Man, it was crazy, man. Like, uh, but, but a blessing at the same time, you know. Um, you know, I grew up in probably one of the roughest parts of Baton Rouge. Um, the e- um, Eaton Park area, Gus Young. And, you know, it was tough. You know, a lot of drugs, a lot of crime. Out of poverty, you know, but uh, it is what it is, man. Got me to who I am today. Uh, gave me some good traits for survival, you know what I mean? So it's a blessing and a curse at the same time, man. But Baton Rouge is a lovely place. I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when did you start playing basketball, like for real? When did you start? I mean, like, or when did you, like, really, you know, pick up the game? Early, you know what I mean? My, uh, my stepfather... Uh, embraced me as far as just the basketball world and, you know, playing with older men and just growing up, you know, with a, you know, with a guy to always be there to, you know, help me on the game, you know? Yeah. At what age was that though, bro? You I mean, remember? You, I mean. That was like about four. God damn, four. <laughs> Shit. About four years old, man. I started playing b-ball, bro. Did you play any sports growing up or was it only basketball? Uh, I played sports growing up. Like I like I played baseball, uh, played football. I was good at football. You know, yeah, I did my shit. thing. You a big man, damn. I mean, when did you realize? Like, when did you become bigger than anyone else? When you realized you was towering over people? You just like when did you realize that? I, I was probably like my eighth grade year. You know, I was realizing how tall I was getting, you know, I didn't stop growing. At one point I thought I was gonna be seven foot. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. like you know, I was a big dude. How tall are you in eighth grade? I'm about six one. 
when you was growing up, was there any other profession that you thought you might want to do besides basketball? Was there anything you want like aspired to do when you was lo- younger? I wanted to rap. Oh shit! I never knew that. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to rap. I thought I was a rapper once upon a time ago. Wait a second. What, what year were you in high school? Just so I get an idea. Uh, two th- 2004. Oh, shit. So, yeah, the cash, cash Money was already out in Louisiana and was doing their thing. Oh, Master yeah, P. man. Okay. That's, a, that's how I grew up. I grew up off that. Yeah, man. Shit. Well, I mean, I'm 47, so, you know, shit, I was done with high school, you know, fucking 91. Um, what was high school basketball like in, in Baton Rouge, like in Louisiana overall? It was cool. It wasn't bad. It was cool. It was super cool, man. It was like basketball was a you know secondary sport in Louisiana, right? You know, because football they breed football, LSU football. Yeah. You know what I mean? So um, to be a part of that wave of just a basketball wave down there in Louisiana, you know what I mean? Like winning the high school championship, you know, going to college and playing for LSU, you know, um, going to the Final Four, you know. Um, uh, bringing notoriety back to you know the sport, you know, uh, since like Shaq and them, and yeah, you know, it's just it's just good to be a part of something like that. You know, it's crazy as I met Shaq at LSU, so he was up for the John Wooden Award. So I'm, that's when I first met Shaq, like like '93. I played college basketball. I was the first Asian in my university I ever played at, which is crazy. But uh, so, did you play against anybody in high school that you end up seeing in college or the pros? Oh my God. Sean Livingston, Josh Smith, Dwight Howard, Al Jefferson, Sebastian Telfair. Wait a second, where's Dwight you know, from? I, Dwight's from Atlanta. Oh, shit. Okay, so you played against him in high. Okay, that's crazy. Yeah. And then uh, you went to LSU. Were you considering any other, high, uh, any other colleges? Like when you get out of high school, when you're getting recruited, were you considering Man, anybody? hell no, man. Hell no, <laughs> man. LSU, man, they took care of me so well, bro. I feel like they threatened me, like, you better not take a visit. Like, I couldn't take a visit. Real? For real? Bro, wow. I couldn't take a visit, bro. Shit. It was like, bro, you can't take no visits. I went to high school on LSU's campus. Oh, shit, I didn't so, know that. Yeah. So imagine that. Like, imagine being, yeah. you know what I mean, the top player in the, the nation, one of the top players in the nation and you go to school on a college campus. Like, like I remember Roy Williams was like, I was like, man, Roy, you ain't sending me no letters or nothing, man. He was like, you really want to come to North Carolina? I said, yeah, I will. Give me a letter. He was like, I just already thought you was already gone, man. Ain't nobody going to let you escape out of there. Shit. I mean, I even went on fucking, I went on like five, six recruiting trips. Like you didn't go on one. Damn. Not on one, bro. Because that's how locked in I was. But, you know, on the flip side, you were a legit phenomenon at LSU, bro. Like, I remember, like, you know, I, I was, I don't really watch too much college now. I think you might have mm-hmm. been the last era when I was watching college because it was like, you, you know, you're on Sports Center and all that shit and Nationals. You were like a sensation, right? So it was like, what was it like being a college kid on national TV, you know, bringing LSU back, bringing a swag back? Like, how, well, tell me, man, like. Man, it was fun, man. Like, I remember the first day, like, you know, coach, you know, at the time, John Brady was uh, my basketball coach at the time. And it was after my freshman year. I had a big year. And um, he was like, the keys are yours, man. Brandon Bass had left. Said, the keys are yours. And, you know, to, to be a part of, like, you know, a wave, you know what I mean? Like, basketball wasn't that big. You know, we had Shaq, you know, Pistol Pete, Bob Pettit, Chris Jackson. Yeah. You know, we had a lot of guys. But at the same time, you know, uh, basketball was kind of lost for a little bit as far as just elite level, Final Four type of caliber teams. You know what I mean? And, like, to be a part of that was great. You know what I mean? And to be from Louisiana and to accomplish that was even greater. So, like... You know, it's a blessing, man, like, to, you know, kind of, you know, um, see all the hard work I put in and, and see what it means to other people. Yeah. So, like, do you have, like, a memorable matchup in college? Is there somebody you went to, like, on, on a one-on-one or just even a team? Is there someone that remembers that just, like, fuck, that team, man, pissed me off, man. You know, that was a good fucking matchup. Like, is there anything that sticks out of your head? Oh, man, well, it would have to be the Final Four, man, if I can go back. You know what I mean? Because, like, you look at that team and see how that team was. 
as far as uh, the UCLA when we played them. Right. They were a really weird looking team. You know, not too big. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Jordan Farmar, you know, a lot of, you know, guys on there, Aaron Afalo. Like, they wasn't too big, but they were quick and they were well coached. And I think, you know, we just got out coached that game. You right. know what I mean? So it's like you go back to that game and you're like, God damn, like, that team was tough, but like, you know, we could have, we should have beat them, you know? Yeah. I mean, for the people who are listening, I got a lot of, you know, aspiring people who, you know, play in high school, play in junior high. I, mean, I have a really wide fan base, right? Could you tell these people, what's it like playing in March Madness, like for real? Like really being out there playing, not sitting on the bench, not sitting in the stands. Ooh. What's that It's shit magical, like? bro. It's magical, bro. You know what I mean? When I go back and think about, you know, our tourney run, you know, and not being the favorite. <laughs> not being you know favorite. what I'm saying? Yeah. Like not yeah. being the favorite and going out there and beating Duke, going out there and beating Texas. Damn. You know what I mean? Those big games, like, it's why you play college basketball. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You yeah. you look you look at all the, the the players after they play. You know a March Madness. You know it, it either hurts them or or help their stock. You know what I mean? So like, yeah. it it's so important in so many ways. College, you know, as far as just the essence of the game and one and done. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, just that type of feel being the champion out of all those teams. You know what I mean? So it's like. It has its advantages, and uh, as far as just you know, basketball, you know, immortality. I feel you know, like I, I just know that the game is growing. You know what I mean? And you know, NCAA, you know, has is seeing how important March Madness and the things about college basketball are important. You know what I mean? So. And they're starting to do the right thing. So, like, you know, you see all this stuff happening and, uh, you know, you see why NCAA feels like, you know, college basketball is so important. Yeah. Let me ask you something, man. So, like, I've talked to Floyd Mayweather, Mike Tyson, basketball players. My coach, you know, back in the day before the March Madness, the NIT was actually the real championship, you know, back in the 70s and shit. And my coach won. He played for Virginia Tech back then. And they won the, uh, the the NIT. So my coach was a real, he was old school black, hated me because I was Asian. And I was always like, I was la- I was kind of lazy. But at the same time, I wasn't gifted with, I'm six feet. I was the shortest dude on the team. You know what I'm saying? And he always gave me a lot of shit. But he always said something that was fucking funny. And I just bring it. This is the first time I've ever asked any athlete besides, you know, like, I'm sorry, any basketball or football athlete. He always said, hey, listen, man, don't be fucking during during playoffs. You know, don't bust no nuts, man. If you bust a nut, man, it'll fuck you up. Like during March Madness, did you were you having sex or were you just nah? You was focused. Uh, Keep it real. Stop playing I'm, with me, big I'm baby. I'm trying to think. Was <laughs> I smashing something? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was. Okay. Ain't no question. Ain't no question. You know, I, I think sex is sex is different than some people, man. Like. It relaxes me. It don't take energy out of me. Like, it makes me relax. It makes me feel calm. Like, I ain't tripping about it. Like, yeah, most boxers say, you know, if you heard boxers when they talk, they say they can't have sex because it fucks up their, like, it makes them less aggressive. Or so. I don't know, man. I guess for boxing, maybe it's different. I mean, shit, man. That's just. I don't, I don't know. I, I would be real aggressive still if somebody <laughs> tried to punch me in my face. No, you aggressive as it is. <laughs> So your senior yeah. year, well, I mean, not your senior year, but I'm saying you passed up on your senior year at LSU. What was the thought process on that? Like, why did you decide to, I mean, what was like the real? You know what, real real talk, man, I fell out with my coach, John Brady. You know oh, what I mean? Like, I fell out with her. You know what I mean? Like, I was even thinking about coming back for my senior year. Oh, fuck. You know what I mean? Because we had an opportunity with some younger guys to, you know, do some things. You know what I mean? I was even thinking but. Yeah, man, I I fell out. You know what I mean? Uh, he thought I had tore a quad muscle in my leg, and um, he thought I was faking. What? Yeah, he Come thought on, I was man. faking. He thought I was faking, and I didn't. You know, I didn't play the last probably two games of the season, 
The only game I played was the tournament game because I had came back off an injury. Right. And, um, yeah. And so when I came to talk to him, he was like, you got to go. It wasn't like, oh, you know, I'm his SEC MVP. You know what I mean? Yeah. All, you know, All-American. You know what I mean? A guy like me stand four years to help you, yeah, not yeah, hurt yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like, like, you know what I mean? So he left. I mean, he uh, he he told me to leave, and I was oh, like, man. "All right." But at the same time, I made it up in my mind it was time for me to go because after the after my sophomore year, we had a, after my sophomore year it was a big season. Went to the Final Four. I should have left then, you know. I should have left then, so I did leave. So um, you know, I was ready my junior year after that. So walk me through draft night. Right, it's two thousand seven. You know, where were you? You know, you're, you're, you're drafted, you know, second round by Seattle, then traded with Ray Allen to the Celtics. Like, where were you? What was going through your head at that point, bro? Man, bro, I was uh, I was at a mentor's house watching a draft, just waiting. And I was just waiting, waiting, man. Uh, you know, I thought I was going to go first round. You know what I mean? I thought I, thought I was going to so go too. first. Yeah. I thought I was going to go first round. And um, it was tough. Like, it was hard. Like, you know what I mean? Like, to think. He was supposed to be in the first round, didn't make it. Now, you know, you hear the stories about second rounders and not guaranteed contracts. You hear about that. But as a competitor, you embrace it. So, yeah. you know, I just embraced it and, you know, and it, started, it worked out for me. So check this out, man. Your rookie year. OK, your rookie year team. Paul Pierce, Rajon Rondo, Kevin Garnett, Ray Allen, Kendrick Perkins, Tony Allen, Sam Cassell, Scalabrini, you got head coach Doc Rivers, right? What was that year like for you? You guys won 66 fucking games. You ended with the NBA championship against my LA Lakers. Please tell me about that year. The good, the bad, the ugly. Give me some stories, dog, please. Your rookie year must have been crazy. It was crazy, man. It was really crazy. It was magical at the same time. You know what I mean? And it's like I got to see so much. You know what I mean? Um, Just... You know, even this culture of just the Celtics organization was so crazy. You know, imagine KG, Paul Pierce, Rondo, Ray, a young Rondo, um, Ray Allen, you know, James Posey, all these guys, Eddie House, like just all those different types of like players and flavors. You know what I mean? That's why I respect Doc so much as far as how he made it happen. You know what I mean? To put those different type of, you know, players together and make a, you know, a, a certain recipe is awesome. You know what I mean? And me to, and to see that, you know what I mean? I got a chance to see how hard work pays off, right? You see KG working extremely hard every fucking day. I was at those games, dog. So, you know, I'm talking about the Laker games, you know what I'm saying? The finals, I mean. Yeah, like, so seeing him every day was just crazy. You know what I mean? I got to see that. You know what I mean? You, you know, it, I felt at times I felt like we was the Beatles. You know what I mean? Because every city, <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? We see so many different like people, and just it was like crazy, man. Like, and I was the rookie too. I was the rookie. So imagine being the rookie on that team, and you got to wake up early in the morning to go get KG something to eat, or Kendrick Perkins want a Powerade at five in the morning because they playing cards. Oh shit. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's just like that was fun. Like I embraced that a lot. Like bro. anything you remember during that that season? You remember anything with with Kobe at all? Uh, man, you know what? It was just a. It was just that season in 2010 when they beat us. I had an opportunity to play against him and and compete. And he got a, you know, like game four when we won the game. I had a big game. Nate Robinson jumped on my back. You know, I I think I earned his respect that game. Yeah. You know what I mean? And he, he noticed just what type of guy I was. You know what I mean? And so now when you're a competitor, Kobe, you know, is a friend. You know what I mean? He's And I think, you know, him walking up to me and knowing my name and really took time to talk to me was just awesome. You know? Yeah, and, damn. Yeah, so I got a chance to really, like, be a part of Kobe's life and, like, him, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, man. What up? what's up, big baby? How you doing? Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? So... It was good to like 
feel that. You know what I mean? It's like he made me feel the same way Jordan made me feel. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you know, those guys are legends, and for them to acknowledge and respect your game is awesome. Yo, man, I heard on Michael Rapport's podcast about an arm wrestling contest on a plane with you versus KG. Can you tell me, like... Man, I didn't want to hurt KG, man. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Imagine me being a rookie. You, it, I break his arm. Yeah. <laughs> arm wrestling. You know what I mean? So I ain't let that man win. You know what I mean? Like, I ain't let him win, but at the same time, I ain't want to hurt him. So it's like, that's all gas, man. But KG kind of strong, though. He wiry strong. Yeah, he like super skinny, wiry. But was there any... Tell me, man, was there any other crazy stories that you haven't told on the, on the internet, on the news? Is there anything else you could think of during, you know, those days? You man, have? it was, whew, man, so many. <laughs> Come on, man, think of one, bro. I, man, bro, I'm trying to think, man. We was in Houston one time, and we had beat. We was like the first team to, to win the Texas Triangle or something. Right. It was like San Antonio at the time, Dallas, Dallas at the time, Houston was good at the time. And that year we won, we beat all three of those teams. And so at the end of the night, we had like a, a fuck fest. <laughs> like Vikings like came in the village and just uh, won, won. You know, Vikings just had a war. And we came to capture all the women. <laughs> oh, my God. Some yeah. Game of Thrones shit, huh? Man, wow. I swear to God, bro. Even... <laughs> I ain't gonna say what coach, but even the coaches was getting oh, some. Oh, don't even crazy. say that. That's crazy. Wow. <laughs> but that year, because that's crazy. First of all, back then, you know, even like for a good ten years to win in the triangle in Texas is crazy. But like, it was hard. It was hard, dog. We party so hard that night, man, bro. That playoff party run so and hard. that playoff run in 07, I'm running back some of these tapes on YouTube, right? And then you guys went to seven games versus Atlanta. Seven versus Cleveland and LeBron, six against yeah. Detroit, and then six against my Lakers. Like, what do you remember about that playoff process? Were you exhausted? Were like, were you like, did you, you know what I'm saying? Like, what do you remember during that whole, that, that process of playoffs was crazy? I just know we were locked in. Yeah. I just know we were locked in. We were so locked in and on, on cue. You know, you think about Tom Thibodeau and his mindset as far as defense. We was so locked in, and Doc was just, you know, he's an offensive guru. So it was just, it was a good chemistry of just all around coaches, players, you know what I mean? And, like, you know, Danny Ainge did a great job, man. Sure. Yeah, you know, Danny Ainge, come on, man. It's just, it's just, man, bro, he was a legend when he played, at the, you know, Celtics. I'm I'm old, bro, so, you know, I remember that. Um, yeah. What was the biggest difference between playing in Boston, in Orlando, and Los Angeles? Um, the culture, the wins, you know what I mean? I didn't get a chance to play for the Lakers. You know what I mean? I played for the Clippers. Yeah. You know, it wasn't, a, wasn't no wins on that side. Yeah, I know. Trust me. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so uh, you know, uh, it's the culture, man. The winning culture. You know what I mean? The blood, sweat, and tears for the game of basketball. Right. Well, let me ask you, man, just out of your own professional opinion, who do you think would have won the NBA championship this year? Had we have a fucking season, you know, it's like ended some. Oh uh, man, bro, it would have been in the Western Conference for sure. I think the championship game would have been Clippers and Lakers in the finals. So who do you think would have came out, the Clippers I, or the Lakers? I think uh, I don't know. See, that's my thing. It would have <laughs> they, they did, somebody would have been playing Milwaukee for sure. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. I Damn. think somebody would have been playing Milwaukee. I think it'd been Milwaukee and Toronto. In the uh, in the Eastern Finals, yeah. I mean, in the Eastern, Eastern Conference Final. Finals. I think that just the way it was going, if we didn't stop, I think one of the motherfuckers would have caught an injury or some shit. Paul, I'm never really thinking about PG3 during the playoffs. And I think we had him, man. I just, fuck, man. It salted our whole season, man. Um, yeah, I know. These next couple questions are kind of like, they ain't controversial, but, you know, I, I talk a lot of shit on my show, and that's why it's been so successful, and that's why I've been charting high and everything else. But I got to ask you, because he's a personal friend of mine and it's my boy and me and you got into some shit. You probably don't remember. We got into an argument. I remember. Uh, yeah. I remember. I <laughs> so remember. Let me ask you, man. What the fuck was the beef between you and Austin Rivers? I don't, I don't get it. Like, 
Well, I was a, a guest on a show on Fox, and they asked me uh, a question about Doc Rivers as far as just did he handle this, you know, that team, Blake and, you know, DeAndre and JJ, you know, um, the right way. And I said, no, you know, I think he was a different coach. Um, you know, yeah, we did have different players, you know what I mean? But at the same time, what he did with the Celtics, it, it's like he didn't do it with the Clippers. Or I feel like he, he couldn't do it because we didn't have the same type of players. And that's all I commented about. What he did was he goes on there and just degrade me as a basketball player. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. if like saying that I was late to meetings and you know what I mean? Like, that's like, yeah. that's like, that's like fucking up my character in a way because you're, you're the coach's son. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like I you're love the coach's... Austin, but that is some snitch shit. If that happened, if he really did that, yeah, that you, you don't do that. It did happen. There's a video. Like he yeah. never came to practice. He's late to practice all the time. He never knows the plays. Like that's what he said. Damn. And I'm like, I play for your dad. I'm one. I'm one of the only rookies to ever play for your dad to ever get, other than Rondo. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like on that team, like name me a guy that stuck. Like. In the second round. You was a second rounder, but you stuck yeah. on the Celtics, a championship Celtics team. And got a chip, by the way. Yeah, yeah. And played. Like, he he had me in the game. Like, so how are you going to sit here and say that? Like, play me in crucial moments. Like, don't do me like that. Yeah, no, I, I feel you. You know what I mean? Because it's like, that's your father. Yeah. Motherfuckers, is, you, you, you know what I mean? They've been knowing you all your years. Like, you saying yeah. that shit. Like, oh, yeah, they for sure think Doc said that shit. Yeah, like, you know what I mean. So, so, and that's at the time when I was trying to get a job. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it, it's you crazy because Austin's a friend of mine. We hang out, we talk a lot of shit, and you know, we got into a fight at a game, a Lakers Clippers game, and this motherfucker almost got me kicked out the stadium. And I was like, "Hey, bro, look, check it out, man. You need to fucking relax, bro. Like, people know me here, but you know, now I can't get into a fight with an NBA. I, you know, I talk a lot of shit on the court. I'm sitting courtside, and the crazy part is this motherfucker, Austin, the one who gave me the tickets." And we get in a fight, and they trying to kick me out the stadium now because we arguing. And I'm like, I looked at them, I was like, bro, are you fucking crazy, bro? You about to? But when I asked though about the situation with you, he didn't really want to talk too much about it. And Austin been on my show before, you know. He's 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 pretty articulate when it comes to basketball and, and and the game and everything. It's serious, but he didn't really want to want to say shit. I'm like, bro, you better say something, motherfucker, because I defended you. And now me and this motherfucker will have to have smoke and this motherfucker, you know, it's... <laughs> no, nah, well, well, he didn't want to say nothing because it was serious and he know it's how I rock and how I roll. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, I ain't seen him yet. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, he he's apologized and said he was sorry oh, yeah. and shit okay. like that. That's good. You know what I mean? So he's apologized. Like, he DM'd me and apologized, but I just thought it was, was fucked up. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. and then coming from his position, like, everybody don't have the luxury of having a dad to be a president. Like, Austin wasn't playing well when he was in New Orleans. He was on his way out trying to figure it out. His dad gave him an opportunity to play. You know what I mean? Yeah, he's a great athlete. He could play the game. You know what I mean? His dad, his dad gave him something a lot of these players are begging for, opportunity. You got, you know what I mean? Like, it wasn't like, oh, you took it. You know what I mean? Like, oh, you 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 took it from the next guy. Like, oh, I took it because I deserved it. No, your dad knows you. Yeah, he knows you deserve it. So he let you and worked it out, gave you a, a whole. But let me hold on, man. A, let me ask you something, dog. And I'm not defending him like that. I just let you, you know, this is your opinion, dog. You a grown man. I'm a grown man. I got a real question for you. If your dad was a coach of the New York Knicks and you was having a hard time getting a job and your dad gave you a job and you played and you, you did, you know, not – better than the bare minimum what would you say if motherfuckers was like hey man see man glenn man he playing because his dad head coach of fucking new york i mean like i don't know like what would you do if you was in his position not take advantage well, if of I, it if, if, I, if i was doing his position i can't help who my father is yeah. but if you know austin you know he's a fucking asshole <laughs> straight up i don't know for what nobody say you know, if you know Austin, he's a fucking asshole. And that's my just thing. It's just the fact that, like, 
if you're going to be an asshole and and have this opportunity like that's crazy to me you can't be an asshole and uh, you know what i mean and feel yeah. some type of way like you can't I like that's just fifth. my thing i played the fifth i ain't even go with you know austin bro I, I, he's I'm, a fucking dick at he's a dick i've been knowing him since he was a baby <laughs> i play i've been he's been he's been coming around me for years yeah you know no, what that's I mean? my like dog, he's... man. We argue all the time, bro. He, we we argue a lot. We argue all the time. Yeah. Still my dog. It is what it is. It's just funny. I had to ask to bring it up. Now that it got this deep, we, let's go on to the next thing, man. It's going to get too hot in this motherfucker. But, yo, <laughs> um, there's a photo of you and DeAndre Jordan in Amsterdam, right? Yes. And, and it looks like y'all smoking some, some gas. Yeah, we smoking weed. Yeah. We in Amsterdam. And, and, you know, the crazy part is, it's, I've been smoking weed for 30 years. No, shit. I've been smoking weed for like a little over 30 years of my life, right? It was frowned upon then, but it's obviously opened up now. You see NBA players talking about it. I've known about this shit because I've been friends with NBA players since the 90s. Did you smoke a lot during your career in the NBA or not? Nah? Well, I didn't smoke during the year. I only smoked, you know, in the off season. Okay. You know what I mean? And, yeah. And like for, for that, like that picture itself is kind of like, you know what I mean? They got me smoking. You know what I mean? Got it in my hand. Like, you know what I mean? I'm sitting at a cafe with 20 people. Yeah. In you know what Amsterdam. I mean? was, of, of like in that. Amsterdam. Yeah. And that right there stopped me from getting a contract. Damn. I was in my contract year that year. Damn. And the For only real? reason why the Clippers re-signed me is because I was with their players. Washington didn't. I was on a contract talk with Washington. Washington didn't want to sign me because of that. Damn, that photo really contributed to not you not playing in the league again. Really, like man, that that photo was the kind of the beginning because after my first year with the Clippers and that happened, I was on contract year. So the the Clippers used that situation to lowball me. Fuck, man. I'm sorry, man. So when they came back to the table that my last year with the Clippers, they was like, we're going to give you a minimum deal. Like, just give you minimum because we don't think you focus, you're smoking, you're doing this, you're doing that. Like, I'm like, what? Damn. And so I went back to the Clippers that last year for a minimum deal. Didn't play the whole year. He had Spencer Hall's plan. You know, he was a great player, you know, range shooting big. But at the same time, he wasn't getting it done. You know, he don't play me the whole year, but play me in the playoffs. You know what I mean? And it yeah. was just like, because he know who I am and he know what I'm capable of doing. So it was it, it was just that last year with the Clippers was just tough. You know what I mean? Like dealing with Doc and being a part of uh, this new Doc regime was for as him being the president. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, I'm, I'm just, you know, I love him as a coach. I, I hate him as a president. Like, he don't know what he's doing. Right. <laughs> Hey, I don't give a fuck out of the way, man. You know, I'm Lakers sauce. Um, yeah. Going on to better things, right? So you played in the uh, in the big three. You won the chip with Coutinho, right? Corey Maggetti, Birdman, and uh, was coached by Nancy Lieberman. Um, what's it like to know Ice Cube on a personal day-to-day level? Oh, uh, it's cool, man. You know what I mean? You, um, It's good to see his uh, – it's good to see him and just to see, you know – who he is and what he's worked and what he's done to this culture. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Um, I love Q, man. He's, uh, he's helped me, bless me in so many ways. So, uh, I appreciate it. No, he's a great dude. I don't know if you know my background, you know, before I was a big jeweler, I was a big record executive, you know? So I was vice okay. president of a uh, priority records. You know, we had master P on our label. We did all his shit. We had a uh, Jay Z. I did one of the, oh, I was one of the, dope. one of the people to sign Jay Z ice cube was the, the, the artist that built, NW and Ice Cube built Priority Records, right? And, you know, I worked with Cube. And, and before that, when I was in college and everything else, high school, I idolized Ice Cube, bro. You know, he's one of the greatest, especially to a certain point when he was really spending that, like that real militia, like that real black power shit. He was killing it. And it just, you know, you couldn't yeah. fuck with him in the 80s and in the, in the early 90s. And it's just like for him to do what he's doing with um, the big three is crazy. You know, I'm like, wow, this is really like, you know, when, when it first started, I was like, ah, okay, whatever. But then I'm like, holy shit, this is getting like big. So, yeah. you know, so you want to chip there too? That's dope, man. Um, let me ask, bro, what, what's next for you, bro? What's what's next for Big Baby? Uh, right now, man, um, right now I'm in the entertainment world. 
Okay. Um, you Tell know, I've done, shame, I've done shameless acting in front of the camera. Right. Um, doing production stuff behind the camera. Um, I love doing, uh, I love creating. I'm a creator. You know what I mean? Uh, that's why, that, that's why I'm in right now. So it's just, it's just been a process. You know what I mean? And also yeah. I want to be in the, in the TV hosting world. So, you know, um, you know, also podcasts, you know, my podcast, I'm going to get start going here in a, in a couple of weeks. You should, bro. It's, yeah, man. Yeah, man. I am, man. I'm going to, I'm going to do it, man. I really think, uh, as far as just a lot of people don't know how articulate and as far as my IQ of the game, you yeah. know, and just my opinion, you know, strong bro, and creative. And when you start hearing some of these people, like just hearing Warren Sapp talk about football, even hearing, um, you know, fucking, uh, uh, even Kendrick Perkins, right? Me and Kendrick, got, we didn't like each other. We got in so many fights, man. I can't even tell you. <laughs> I fuck it. Dude, he, he told me at a game, OKC Laker game, he said, hey, bro, I'm coming back here after the game, right? He mm -hmm. goes, I'm going to fuck you up. I'm like, come back here, bitch. I'm going to have you fucking jump. Man, you, you, bro, we in LA, dog. I'm from LA. Homie, I grew up with Crips, dog. I'll have you robbed outside the fucking, the, the locker room, man. You tripping. We start arguing shit. But when I started to hear him talk about basketball, and I was like, wow. You know, here I am, and this is such a terrible generalization. I don't care how I looked at it about it, but I was like, man, this big motherfucker don't know shit. He's really, really, like you said, articulate. I know you know about the game. You should have a podcast out there, you know? I encourage you. When I talked about my life experiences being the only Asian American in hip-hop back in the fucking 80s, 90s, my sports, you know, career, jeweler, just interacting with people, just how I deal with being an entrepreneur. Look, man, this is the best time for you to jump in the podcast world. It's like the gold rush right now, you know, and I think that, I mean, I'll be tuning in, you know, I definitely want to check out, see what you got to say. So the COVID-19, right? This coronavirus situation, fucking everything up. What What are you doing right now? How are you spending your quarantine? Man, bro, I'm just getting on my, getting my life right. You know what <laughs> I mean? Like, that's yeah. all I can do, man. You know what I'm saying? Like, preparing for when the world open back up. Yeah. You, you been know, um, exercising at all, or are you just, I mean, yeah, I've been exercising, you know what I mean? Getting ready, you know, uh, sneaking in the gym, you know, getting some <laughs> shots up. <laughs> yeah. What you, what you think, man? Be honest. You think this is some conspiracy? You think it's a scam, or you think that this shit is really, I mean, I have my opinion about it. I'm just curious what you think about this whole COVID 19 coronavirus. Um, man, you know what, man? Like, it's had a different effect on me. You know what I mean? Like, it may it makes me think about you know just more you know what i mean like the world shuts down and and i never want to be in a situation where i am at a like a standstill yeah you no know? so it's just like all it has done is just making sure that i got everything focused you know uh, upon and uh, you know my my just thirsty for residual income like like that's just my mind. That's my mindset. Like because of this, so you know, um, I'm not really worried about the worry about the world. I'm just trying to find my way in it, be successful, and yeah, plant my seeds and grow my harvest the way I want them to be grown, and you know, have nobody tell me what to do. You know, so I hear that. That's my focus. That's how I feel about you know Corona. You know, <laughs> no, it's it's fucked up a lot of shit. I've had. Some blessings come my way too, though. You know, I know people are out there really doing bad, but, you know, um, yo, bro, that's pretty much everything, man. I just wanted to, before we end this, I wanted to say, look, man, you know, I think a lot of people are guilty of uh, trolling, you know, and talking their shit, right? Even though I'm not, you know, if it's really something serious, you're not, but ain't nothing been serious on the internet for me to like, you know, so I'm in unless you hating on my kids or my wife or something, I don't really say much. I just kind of yap my mouth. So I wanted to tell you, you know, now that you on my show that I meant no malicious, nothing. I was just talking shit. You know what I mean? I fuck with you. Um, I obviously knew who you were way before any of this shit had happened. And, and, uh, it sucks that the situation was a, a serious one and I was joking about it. So I apologize. I didn't intend it for it to be something like, you know, hurtful towards you, me talking shit. So, you know, I appreciate you jumping on the show. Um, one of the things I ask everybody who comes on my show, and I don't even know how much you know about me or anything, but is there anything you'd like to ask me before we get off this this episode? <laughs> Man, bro, you know, uh, 
I'm a big music guy, and uh, I want to one day be in the music industry. My biggest thing is to say, whatever you, what advice would you have for a person that's trying to be in that lane? Getting started and everything? My, yeah, yeah, getting started in the mindset. Okay, check this out, man. I realize that this has helped me a lot later in life and, and later in my career, not early. Look, I don't know if you, I'm assuming you want to get into hip hop and R&B and whatever it may be, right? And that's black music, so that's good right there. I really do think if you don't listen to any old school shit, whether it be James Brown, Earth, Wind & Fire, anything old school, you got to definitely know the history of music from even the Beatles, you know what I'm saying? Just know, like you said, I mean, I think you have to, I don't know what your, what your tastes are, but as long as you have a well-rounded palette of music in you and you love music and you know that, then that's like the first and foremost. The second, which is really the first, you got to have an amazing business attorney. You have to have a music attorney who has your back. Glenn, I'm telling you right now, from all the deals that I've done, from Jay-Z to Dr. Dre to, to everyone, if you don't have a good attorney on your, on your side, you're never going to be able to accomplish shit because you could do all this work and then not get paid the right way for it. You feel me? You got to make sure everything is in your best interest. You're giving fair deals out and things like that. So make sure you got a good attorney on your side. That's number two. Number three, bro, man, understand the entire game. There's a book called Everything You Want to Know About the Record Business. I would suggest you finish it from beginning to end at least two or three times. It will give you much more insight so you understand all the language that's going on with the business. And then from there, once you have all the business shit handled, you go out and have fun, man. You know, it's just, it's business. You let motherfuckers know this ain't nothing personal. This is what it is. There's a fine print here. It ain't my fault you ain't read this, you know? I want you to understand. Yeah, dog. Right. I mean, I'm just saying, for instance, you become executive CEO of the record label and you bought somebody a car, right? But it's like, hey, man, you asked for this car. This is coming out your budget, not mine, motherfucker. You know what I mean? Unless we sell 10 million records and I'm just blessing you. And there's certain things. You just have to have a lot of knowledge. Don't jump in it because it's something you want to do for fun. It can be fun, but it'll also be a nightmare. So, you know, the more I knew about the business side of the music business, the more powerful I was. And even still, it just was kind of a crazy business. But if that's something you want to do, I don't want to discourage you not to. I'm just letting you know, ask a friend of a friend who is a good, you know, music attorney that knows music contracts and things like that. See if you could work with them on a retainer, you know, put somebody on, boom, because you need a legal person to start your, your thing and have them in the background making sure they're protecting you. And then... You know, the best part is, you know, trying to find out that new music, the, you know, the next who and, and the, you know, and all these hard artists. There's so many people out there. There's so much talent. It's just you got to go find them and put them in the right places. You know what I'm saying? All right. Thanks, Big Doc. No, man, you're welcome, man. And listen, man, everyone, uh, how can they find you, man, on social media and everything? What, 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 are, your, what are your social handles? Uh, uh, yeah, man, it's GB Baby Davis. Right. Um, and then uh, we got the podcast coming up. It'll be all on my IG, Instagram. So, you know, just plug the, plug the IG and uh, follow me from there. There it is. Now, that's Big Baby Glenn Davis right there. Thank you for coming on the show. Yo, Miles, man, throw on some of that Lakey Lake, and we'll be right back with the show. So, yo, we're back, man. Um, I I'm doing the show a little different today. You know, I write down my notes and I usually kind of write down like real deep notes. Today, I was like, you know what? I don't want to like get too into the script. I'm like, let me just freestyle this bitch. You know, I've been doing this shit for 79 episodes and I think no cap, 70 episodes. I had a, you know, a script right in the show, like boom, right into these topics and going in order. Man, fuck all this shit. We're going to do a podcast people do, man. We're going to freestyle this bitch, you know, it's just, that's what it is. But you know what, man, I got to appreciate, I, I got to say, say big shout out to my boy, Glenn, um, you know, big baby Glenn Davis. And, um, you know, obviously Austin Rivers is my boy, you know, and um, I got to say something to Austin, man. I don't, you know, we talk a lot and he's going to randomly hit me up. So I'm not even going to hit him first. I'm going to wait for him to hit me. And maybe Austin listen to the show. Who fucking knows? But, you know, I talk that shit. It is what it is. Speaking of sports and staying on there, uh, I talked to Jock. I know I brought up his name, but, you know, man, we talk every day. So it's like, 
Jock Peterson hit me up and he's like, yo, man, we're training soon. We're about to start, you know, start training with the Dodgers. And he he was actually training. And um, he's telling me they're about to get like, they're about to get it in like, you know, next month, start getting it serious. So I, who fucking knows? I don't know when opening day happens. It's going to be exciting. You know, Korean baseball started. That shit's popping. But uh, I want to give you guys a little exclusive, right? I don't mention this anywhere on the my Instagram, nowhere on my Twitter um, I want to feel like I give you guys an exclusive, you know, news. I give you guys, you know, like, you know, news and shit, right? So anyways, I had a meeting over Zoom with uh, Network and the team, right? And I have four more drops this year, okay? I don't give a fuck about resale value, all right? I want people to have a cool product. I want them to have something fun. And yeah, it's cool. So check this out, man. I was supposed to drop at least 500 to 1,000 vacuum sealers on this last release because of COVID and everything else without 300 was the most it can get out. And I think we start shipping real soon. But, you know, coronavirus fucked a lot of things up. With that said, I said, that's not going to pop. Okay. And now my my vacuum sealers are going for $1,000 on StockX, on eBay and everything else. Look, man, fuck that. I told you guys there was a big chance I'm going to re-release them. So I am. I don't know if I'm doing it next month. Um, or if it's going to be, you know, like in a, or yeah, it would be like sometime in June, I think, right. I am going to re-release the gold vacuum sealers. I'm going to put out at least another 700. I might even put a thousand out. I don't give a fuck. I want people to have them. If 60,000 people are trying to get a thousand vacuum sealers, you think that's going to fuck up the value? No. Okay. It's going to be fine, but I'm dropping that. But this is where the real exclusive information comes. I am dropping a Ben Bala did the chain gold scale. I right? a one kilogram, you can weigh up to a kilo on this bitch, a gold scale. Please believe everything that I'm dropping, I have one for myself that I use and actually have because I use a scale on a regular basis, right? I sell gold. The fuck you think, right? You don't use it for my weed shit, but, you know, and that's another topic we're going to have. But um, I am dropping a gold scale. I am thinking sometime by September, I'll be dropping that gold scale. And then I got two more things dropping. I can't give you guys that info right now. That's just too much for this motherfucking episode. For the people who won, um, we are not shipping these yet. I haven't got mine yet to, to give away. So once I get them, you know, uh, I know my boy Nelson. I got to fucking take care of him. This motherfucker sent me the illest N95 mask I've ever seen in my life. Some guys are saying, oh, it looks like a job strap. Uh, you look like you're wearing a jock. Motherfucker, I don't give a fuck what it looked like. I don't give if the motherfucker was painted like a penis. Let me tell you something. The shit has an exhaust. Has It's rechargeable by USB, micro USB. It has a button that lets you push. You know what I'm saying? So you can filter the air out and all that shit. It's fucking insane. It is ideal for London. And it's even good for Ryder, you know. Um, got one for everyone in the family except, except for Nicolette. Nelson, I got you on the fucking, listen, man, I feel so bad. Nelson's done so much for me. I have this motherfucker's money counter. I got a vacuum sealer coming for him. And I have to fucking, I just, it's crazy. I haven't shipped anybody out their uh, money counters when I got a couple extra ones. Sorry, guys. If you didn't know you getting one, then I just, I just got nothing for you. So check this out. Uh, I got into a little situation. I had to go to Beverly Hills Ferrari. And um, I had uh, went to go visit a friend real quick. And it's like, when I say real quick, I'm talking three minutes, right? And I see tons of fucking people outside, you know, acting up and everything. On the way home from Beverly Hills, I stopped at one of my favorite Mexican restaurants in LA. It's just a taco stand. It's cool. But it's like organic. They have grass-fed meat. They have organic beans. They have, you know, uh, wild-caught fish. Everything is very fresh. And the prices are definitely... How do you say? What the fuck? Why am I? Oh my God. Why am I? They're, they're matched. Sorry. They're, they're what they should be for good, clean food, right? So anyways, the place is called Planchas, and it's on 3rd and Sweetser, right? It's right next to my old store, next to my old house. And I'm sorry, not my old store. It's next to my store in the Beverly Center. And Planchas is right there, you know, right in the dead, dead smack of town. They have the best fucking tiger shrimp. On Sundays, they got tamales, and um, it was just Cinco de Mayo. I went on fucking Cinco de Cuatro <laughs> and um, went to Plancha and I got my son his dinner. I got Nicolette her dinner. I got my mother-in-law dinner and I got my dinner. 
uh, rider and Kai, I don't really eat that, but Kai does like quesadillas. But I had like all these beautiful, like I had this shit all set up, boom. And I'm in my pista. I'm in the Ferrari. So I'm driving through the canyon and an M5, you know, either 2019 or 2020, a brand new M5 competition series pulls up on me. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because I was on my live two nights ago. Is what, two nights? Yeah, two nights ago I was on my live in my Instagram live and someone said, hey bro, how'd you like getting the business by the M5? And I'm like, all right, man. I hate when motherfuckers say the stupid shit like this. And I'm like, look, man, let's go live. And I click on dude's page and, and he didn't go live. I don't know if it was him or if it was his friends. I don't know if dudes has listened to this or maybe his homies listened to this and he's been bragging about it. Let me say something real quick, bro. M5s are fast, man. I have one, you know, and, and my boy Gintani does some super fast M5s. They go to ship sector. They're super fast and everything. And there's guys who are really good drivers. You could be an amazing driver being an M5 and pretty much smoke anybody that's on the street that doesn't know how to drive. Um, I know how to drive. Um, I've been on too many quick strikes. You know, we've been doing 185, 190 on these rides, uh, doing 140 in semi-traffic, and we are driving with extreme excellence. All right, I'm racing against hypercars, you name it, in GT3 RSs and doing, and my pista's probably the best car I've ever owned. So I start getting a little nasty on the canyon, you know, whatever, and we're not going anything crazy, probably doing like 90 in the area where people are going 20. And the thing about the pista is I have... My entire family's dinner in fucking, you know, plastic containers. These tiger shrimps with fucking marinade sauce and stuff. Then my son's burrito and everything. And I'm thinking like, fuck, man, I'm already all in, man. Fuck this, you know, whatever. And so we're going through cars and everything else. There's a dip. And I know where the dip is because I drive up this fucking canyon every day. And there's a dip there. And I'm like, yo, man, my pista is slammed on the ground. When I'm just going straight on a regular, not even a bumpy road, a smooth road, and I hit a reflector. The, my rear diffuser gets hit on there. And I ain't like, you know, it's, you're talking about 15 bands just to get a fucking plain thing without paint. And I saw the dip. So I slowed down there. On top of that, having my, my, my family's food in there. So I'm driving and I'm following this dude. And I've been past my house, past the street. And I'm thinking, I hope this dude, just we just see an open road. That's how much fucking traffic was on the road. We couldn't have an open chance at fucking 4.30 p.m. in the afternoon or 5 p.m. And... um. Was it 5.30? I forgot. It was dinner time, though. My kids eat dinner at 5.30. And I'm just waiting for this dude. And I was just like, you know what? Fuck this, man. I was ready to go on the freeway. Be like, yo, bro, you really want to run this? You don't really want to run this. Because I will fucking eat your lunch. I will fuck your whole shit up. That's the, look at, man. If dude had the same skills, okay, and was in a GT3 RS, which would be comparable to that M5, all right? Let's say he was in a GT2 RS, which is much more comparable to my car. I would still give that dude the business in my pista. But again, you know, we'll see. Maybe dude responds to me on, on, I don't know. I don't know who the fuck he is. I didn't get his name, but maybe he hits me up in Instagram, the DMs or anything. I'll be like, yo, dog, we got nothing but opportunity. We should do this shit immediately before, you know, everything opens up for real. Let's go out to the fucking one-on-one by Calabasas and let's smash. You know what I'm saying? Let's see who gets to 200 first. Who gets to 175 first. And I'm, I'm ready, right? Before I do that though, what I do want to do is I want to get a GoPro connected in my car, right? Someone suggested about the mount. I got that. Um, someone needs to teach me how to fuck. I haven't even turned it on yet, but I do need to fuck around and figure out this GoPro thing because I know it's whatever. I don't want to ask no YouTubers or whatever, but I got the mount, the suction cup mount that could go on the outside or on the window and the inside, whatever. I'm going to figure this shit out so motherfuckers can see how nasty I get on these drives and whatever and the last thing I need, though, is for a fucking police officer to pull me over and see that shot, just throw that bitch on the floor and be like, fuck you, because um, it'd be evidence. But I don't know how I'd figure that out. Anyways, going on, I need to get a GoPro connected ASAP. What else was I just going to fucking say right now? But speaking of which, I do need to get my car, my Pista, I need to get the suspension dialed in. I need to raise the rear about another half inch. The motherfucker is too goddamn low. I'm scraping everywhere. And I love it. The only thing is, the car is so fast, I need to utilize and be able to go at full maximum capacity on the motherfucking speed on that car. You know what I'm saying? Especially on the streets when I'm acting like a fucking idiot. Speaking of which, my track hawk has not been touched yet. I had the front windows tinted right and I had, you know, um, nothing else done. So uh, I got the springs. I got my IBAC uh, Pro Sport suspension. So I'm going to drop the car a little bit. 
Uh, I'm going to do some accent paints, and then I'm going to get time. I need to get down pipes, get it tuned, and I need to get this done immediately. Now, the crazy part is yesterday, and I told you I guys been, I've been cutting down my bills and everything, and my, my GTC4 Luso, there's something up with the four-wheel steering. I'm getting an error, so I need to go to the dealership, and, and I haven't dropped it off yet. And I just got this fucking track hawk. There's 130 miles on the track hawk. 130 miles. And I already considered getting rid of that and the fucking GTC4 Luso and just keeping the Pista and grabbing a fucking Cullinan because I just want one really bad. And I've been looking at one. I just saw, I saw two and I'm like, dude, dude, I'm just going to do it. And I'm doing everything I fucking can to not do this. I'm like, bro, I got to chill. With that said, um, I already told you guys I got rid of the Urus. I had a talk with a guy from GM two days ago. I have the first delivery of the 2021 Cadillac Escalade coming in. That motherfucker looks like a spaceship now. The exterior is sick. The interior is crazy. They really have real seven seating in there. They have actually eight, but I didn't do bench. I did captain's chairs in the second row. And uh, I got, you know, I only did this because the third row now sits low. So it sits like the Pacifica minivans do. It doesn't have that little fucking elevated rear third row. I fucking hate. I can't stand that. But it has three real rows, which obviously I need because, you know, to have a family of five, including a nanny and my in-law and whatever, things like that. Or if I want to have both my in-laws in the car with the kids. And uh, I can't wait to get that motherfucker. I am trying to cut down, so I got to chill, but I got the new Escalade coming. I literally have one dropping probably in September, so I have one of the first ones. And uh, I'm excited about it. On to other news. I saw a video on Instagram of the Americana and I, I follow the Americana page. That's how much I fucking love the Americana in Glendale. I don't give a fuck. All right. I've been there in months and they're playing the fountain show and they're playing fucking um, Frank Sinatra. And I'm just like, fuck man, I miss the Americana so fucking much. My kids miss getting the bread at Cheesecake Factory. Right? I miss seeing my uncle. Right. I miss going to the fucking movies there. I miss going to Amici. I miss going to fucking, you know, uh, what else is there in there? There's just there's just so much. Uh, Cafe Verde inside fucking Nordstrom, right? And um, why the fuck am I drawing another blank right now? Obviously, Dean and DeLuca is, is great. They used to have a ramen bar on top of Katsuya there. Katsuya is even good too. Anyways, going on, I miss the Americana. I, I can't wait to start getting outside. Um, it is starting to drive me a little crazy. I just got booked for this thing with Sotheby's that's going on in New York City, and it's going on in like a month and a half. And I don't know, man. I, and you know, unless they send me a jet, and even if they send me a jet, I don't know. I'm really, really iffy about this whole situation. But right about now, because my boy Joe Vargas, aka at Hustler on Instagram, I need to help my boy out a little bit. He has been giving money out paying people's light bills, doing things like that. And because he's doing all this fresh, dope-ass shit for mankind and for the, you know, for the good of society, I got to plug his store, buylegalmeds.com. If you didn't hear in the last two episodes, you'll hear it now. My man Joe has started the best CBD business in the entire state of Nevada. He has many stores throughout, you know, Las Vegas area and everything else. Don't think they're open just yet. But their website is 24-7, all right? BuyLegalMeds.com has the best selection of true full-spectrum CBD that you can find anywhere. I have shopped for CBD all over the place. I've seen it here and there. Um, he is obviously selling non-psychoactive, meaning non-THC CBD. This is actual real shit to help you with pain, anxiety, sleep, your diet, whatever the fuck it may be. At Hustler has it at bilegalmeds.com. Now, I've told you guys the Cloud Nine syrup, I fuck with that super heavy. I'm starting to run low because I gave the Dust Brothers, Jordan and Miles, six bottles of the shit, and now I regret giving it to them. I'm like, fuck you, you go get your own shit from bilegalmeds.com. And as a behind the baller listener, you get 50% off the entire fucking website. All right. All you got to do is use the discount code behind the baller. Okay. That's buylegalmeds.com. Use the discount code behind the baller. I just ordered some shit last week. I just got it. I got some new tea. Don't know why. I was like, you know what? I want some CBD tea. Seen it on there. Never had it. Used it. 
I had that spider bite on my neck. That's why I had that fucking Supreme Band-Aid on my neck. Guess what? I just decided to use the fucking CBD fucking cream on my neck. That shit went away by 50%. I used Neosporin and I used cortisone one day each and nothing happened. I use fucking CBD and I go to bed, I wake up and the motherfucking shit is fucking almost gone, right? It's crazy. And there's a CBD pain gel that, you know, they have. And um, Jordan uh, Winter has a, a dog, one half of the Dust Brothers. So I got him some CBD tinctures for pets. And I heard that shit, my sister lives by it. So again, go to bilegalmeds.com. They got the best CBD shit. If you got anxiety, having a hard time sleeping, you know, you got you need pain meds, you don't want to fucking use Tylenol or use Vicodin or any kind of fucking narcotic. CBD is the answer. Their Cloud9 syrup, I fucking I swear by it. I've been actually smoking the CBD pre-rolls, which is fucking hilarious. And I'm kind of just noticing myself get a little calmer. It's the syrup that I'm really like, whoa, this shit is legit. And I've been mixing it with Sprite now. I went and bought a gang of Sprite. And um, look, go to bilegalmeds.com or at Hustler. Ain't going to be giving motherfuckers money anymore. You know, I'm trying to help my boy out because he has been doing a lot of good. Bilegalmeds.com. It's crazy. Uh, now that I think about it, you know, I was talking about going to the market to get Sprite. And I really did go just to get Sprite, right? And now with the pandemic, there is a shortage on meat, right? And for the first time ever in Wendy's history, the fucking Wendy's fast food chain, you know, there was a commercial that was so fucking famous in the 80s. And it was, where's the beef? Where's the beef? You guys are probably never fucking know because some of you guys are born in the 90s, whatever. But it was a very famous commercial. And, and, and you know, it's a hamburger place. It's a fast food hamburger place. And now they're not serving meat. In fact, they don't have meat on the menu at Wendy's. So it's just fucking mind-boggling to me. Great for me, but mind-boggling for other. It's just crazy. So my son, London, all three of my kids, actually, they eat this dish. It's a Spanish dish called picadillo, right? And my mother-in-law makes it to perfection, now, she does two versions, the gangster version, and then she does the version for the kids, which is 100% organic grass-fed beef, 90 to 93% lean. So we're talking about per, like the best you can get. There's like, you know, diced up little potatoes. There is um, rice, and then there's some spices and certain things. And then she uses organic 100% gluten-free soy sauce. Anyways, this dish is delicious, and my kids eat it every single day. I told you how picky they are. So this is an essential dish, especially for London, because Ryder's starting to eat pizza, starting to eat small other things, and open up his palate a little bit. Ryder eats this and dinosaur chicken nuggets. That is fucking it. I don't give a fuck where the fuck we are. We could be at Mr. Child's. I got to bring the food in the fucking little canister so he can eat. That's how picky Ryder is. And um, anyways, I went to the store, and they're only allow, allowing people to buy two ground beef packs, period. Now, the thing is, I go to three different markets, okay? There is a Whole Foods that is not necessarily close to me, and then, then there is a Vons, and there's a Ralph's, and I hit all three of these places. I have to drive quite a bit to hit these grocery stores because it's not really a grocery store next to my house. So I go to Vons first, and there is no meat at all whatsoever. It's about 8 p.m., now, I know people say, go in the morning, whatever. Okay, great. Motherfucker, I need to go right then and there. I check and I see, okay, ground beef is there. They did have it. The organic ground beef. Everything else is fucking gone. Every kind of steak, meat, it's fucking ridiculous. I'm like, yo, what the fuck? And I'm going to have some asshole. Well, meat ain't going over. Shut the fuck up, bitch. I'm telling you what the fuck I saw, motherfucker. All right? There's still no motherfucking paper towels. All right? By the way, I got to fucking say what up and shout out to Daniel Kang out of um, Seattle, Washington. My man sent me two big ass 12 packs of Bounty. Much love. Some other homie sent a bunch of paper towels, like restaurant style paper towels, like the commercial style. And I don't know what your name was. I don't know who the fuck it is, but thank you very much for that. Appreciate it. Back to the story. There are no paper towels inside the grocery stores. There was some fucking toilet paper, very little. And I go in there. And I see the organic beef. It was the only thing left. And I was checking why. And I look and I'm like, all right. So usually the regular ground beef could be anywhere from like $2.50 to 4 bucks, whatever it is, depending on what you get, pounds, whatever. The organic ground beef only comes in one pound. And they come, you know, there's like three different brands. This shit was $12, $11.99 per pack of ground. I'm like, yo, this is no joke. And they still were only letting you get two packs. I got three. And I got a bunch of extra little bullshit like chips and fucking snacks and all my little fucking, you know, all my little snacks that you guys know I love to fucking have. 
So I put one pack of beef in the front. I put one back, you know, like kind of immediately after that. And I got one way at the end. So the dude wouldn't even fucking pay attention. He has no idea, right? I go to the next door, which is Whole Foods. And all they have is fucking organic shit. Now the butcher was the only person that had organic beef. And he said, you could only get two pounds. And I'm like, all right, cool. Now, the crazy part about there is organic beef, uh, 90% lean from the butcher. And I barely caught this motherfucker because about to close. He had one point like six pounds. I said, I'll take it. I don't give a fuck. So I took that, grabbed that, boom, took off, headed to fucking Ralph's. And I go to Ralph's and I just start grabbing random shit. I start seeing cookies. I start seeing all this other shit. Boom. Go to the meat section. Every fucking thing you could think of, red meat wise, is cleared out. Then I asked this guy, excuse me, where is the organic beef at? Because my wife does all the shopping in the house. We do like, you know, um, the fuck is the fucking crate shit, the fucking, uh, the fucking online, not Amazon Fresh, but anyway, we did all that shit, but all those things aren't really working right now. Costco doesn't have organic beef most of the time, and I heard their shit's fucking dry as a motherfucker now. So I see the signs in all three places, two beef, pea per person, blah, blah, whatever. And I asked the guy, I said, is there an organic beef section? He goes, yeah, over there, everything's organic over there. And it's next to like the impossible foods and stuff. And there's crazy part was there's a bunch of impossible meat there. There was lean turkey, you know, ground beef, whatever, ground turkey. And I see, I was like, okay, shit, there's six packs of ground beef here. I don't want to be a fucking dick. I grabbed four. I did the same thing. Put two in the front, two in the back. But these motherfuckers are going for stupid money. Why am I telling you this shit? It's because my son, Ryder, only eats two things, period. That is the Piccadilly, which, you know, involves the, the ground beef. Now, the thing is this. My wife has already given up, and she's never have ever. It's very specific, but she's like, fuck it. If it can't be organic beef, it'd be anything. The only thing is... The reason why it is there is because it's so fucking expensive, I think, and it's three times the price of regular beef, but she's starting to worry because, you know, we've bought, I have a fucking, we have three refrigerators, we have a freezer as well, and I done bought so many motherfucking dinosaur chicken nuggets that I'm hoping the pandemic is done by the time this shit goes, you know, dry. But anyways, enough about that. Uh, Looking over all my items, my Ben body, the chain items, like my slides, everything else. I've been going to StockX a lot, checking things out. I've been going to eBay and I've been doing like updates on trying to get an idea of what people are paying for, right? And if you buy something on StockX and you see a price sold, yes, technically that's what it's sold for because they don't do like that little bullshit. It really does get sold for that. Whether someone bought it for their homie, I don't know what people's thoughts are right because there's things that are listed for ninety nine thousand for a pair of shoes whatever the fuck it may be there's something listed for a million dollars whatever the fuck it is i'm looking at bear bricks now because bear bricks are readily available on StockX now one thousand percent only uh they do sell 400 1000 owners i haven't checked i'm just checking out what one thousand percent bear bricks are going for and in the pandemic bear bricks have gone up for sure 100 percent now on StockX, you could definitely get a better deal than anywhere else for a Bearbrick 1000. You're going to definitely get a better deal than eBay. You're going to get a better deal than a retail store. But I will say this. If I ever had to sell my 1000%, which I don't see happening for a very, very long time. And when I mean a long time, I mean five years. That'd be the soonest I could see myself saying, fuck it, you know what, I'm just going to get rid of it. But I don't see myself, you know, I want my kids to have these things, you know, they're going to be valuable and they're going to hold their value. And uh, speaking of which, damn, I'm sidebarring like a motherfucker. The new Banksy piece is dope. Just check that out. Make sure you go Google new Banksy at a hospital and you'll see that. Back to Bear Bricks. If I were to sell my Bear Bricks again, understand this. When Ronnie uh, Paravino or Piravino sold his cause collection on heritage auctions. It went for, it was going low for a while. And then he broke all the records for all the cause toys, right? Now, don't know why he sold them. He needed money. I don't fucking know. I think cause don't fuck with them anymore. But I regret selling my first, you know, set of, of uh, bear bricks. And I had to because of space and everything else. But going on, I have 73 1,000% bear bricks right now. And there's fucking boxes all over the fucking place, right? In my storage. They're all organized thanks to Sean, my assistant. But if I were to sell them, please believe I would do another gallery thing. And I don't care if it's a virtual gallery. I wouldn't give a fuck. But I'd find a gallery in Beverly Hills or, you know, whether it be fucking uh, um, Gagosian or somewhere dope. 
and I'd have a showcase again. I don't know how the fuck the art's going to go. People social distance in museums kind of, but I would do that. And it doesn't matter what StockX sells for and what the street people do and what they want because now Bear Brick 1000s are inside homes of people who own Picassos, people who own fucking, you know, Warhols and Basquiat's, right? So it's like, look, man, if I decide to sell it, I'm going to sell them for fucking crazy bread. So don't always look at StockX pricing because sometimes it's who the seller is and that right there could determine a different price point. And with that said, ladies and gentlemen, episode 79 is over. I had a lot of fun on this episode. I love freestyling for you guys. And I want to say thank you so much. You have no idea. I've had a really rough week. This has been therapeutic, talking to you people, telling you guys, you know, what's been good, what's been bad. And uh, please, if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button. Obviously, tell a friend to tell a friend. Uh, I want to say this because I haven't said it in a few episodes, but this is not your practice life. Always remember that. And another thing too, never apologize. All right. You know, I don't apologize. Even if I'm wrong, don't apologize. All right. With that said, we are the fuck out of here. Where's my boy LL? And I'm not talking about LL Cool J. I'm talking about that Lakey Lake. Yo, Lakey Lake. Come on, my G. Take us out of here. All right, y'all. Peace. Peace.